afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Farzana Hamasi. I'm an assistant professor of ethnomusicology at the University of Toronto. I am delighted to be here and uh, chairing this panel um, with two scholars, um, the title of one of whom is both of whom are very important, but we'll get that to that, that in a second. The name of the panel is From State Policy on the Female Voice to Women Musicians' Narratives. So uh, Dr. Nahi Siong Dust will be our first presenter. Her paper is titled The Islamic Republic and Solo Female Singing. Um, uh, as I think probably all of you know, uh, Dr. Siong Dust is a postdoctoral associate and lecturer at the um, Iranian Studies Program at Yale University. She's also author of the recently published 2017, January 2017 mm -hmm. publication, um, Soundtrack of the Revolution, a uh, groundbreaking book on music after uh, 1979 within Iran, um, Stanford University Press. She does not have a table selling copies of it outside, but she should. Okay. And uh, this talk will be followed by um, Paola Messina, um, who is an associate producer at the Arab Studies Institute. Her paper will be entitled, Reclaiming Stage and Image, Iranian Women Musicians in Their Own Voices. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for sharing. Hello again, everyone. You will have had so enough of me by the end of today, and certainly by the end of tomorrow, so here I go again. I'm grateful to Fazlana for having plugged my book into her introduction, and I may, I may do so again myself. Um, so the ban on the female voice remains uh, one of the enduring red lines of the Islamic Republic. And in fact, I chose to open my talk uh, with the cover of my book, uh, again, not only for promotional purposes, but also because it is quite appropriate for my talk today. The image is of the electro-rock musician Marad Afsharian. It's part of a series, a photography series by Nusha Tabakolian called Listen. Uh, she captures professional female singers in the passionate act of singing um, and we see these women, women, and we see the passion on their faces. The series is called Listen, but of course we cannot hear them. The implication being, of course, that their solo voices are banned um, in the Islamic Republic. So what has been the position of the state on the solo female voice? Those who know Iran, of course, know that before the 1979 revolution, some of Iran's greatest singers of all times have been women and some of them still continue to command huge audiences across the world, you know, for example, Gugush or Parisa. Um, in fact, Iran had a very early emancipatory figure, a figure of a, of a female um, uh, singer in the, in the person of Amar, Amar Moluke Bazirizadeh, who did a groundbreaking act uh, very early on in 1924 at the Tehran Grand Hotel, and many among you will know this uh, anecdote, of singing to a mixed gender audience uh, unveiled, and in fact singing a very sort of anti-veiling um, uh, uh, song based on Iraj Mirza. This is something that I uh, drew from a piece that um, Professor Hushang Shahabi, who's present here, wrote about the importance of female singers in Iran. And the cabaret performer, Mahvash, who's been mentioned several times today. Um, so we have Bubush uh, in the large photograph, Ramar up there, and Mahvash, of course, was so popular that when she died prematurely in a car accident in 1961, the funeral processions uh, for her passing were the largest public gathering that Tehran had ever witnessed. Uh, Gabe Braley and Sasan Fatemi have written about uh, some of these uh, figures and popular performers, including Ugush, as has Farzan Hemasi, and as I mentioned, Hushang Shahabi, um, about their performance. And Parmis Muzaffari has written about female singing in post revolutionary Iran with a focus on Parisa. But the newly instituted Islamic Republic officialdom viewed music as suspect. And I think after having sort of had a centuries long review of the uh, issues surrounding music and morality today, uh, turns out the Islamic Republic is not the first and certainly not the only ruling um, uh, authority to have a problem with music and um, women within that particular role. 
Um, after all, Revolutionary Rida Ayatollah Khomeini, as first, his first edict on music was that it should be eliminated completely, that it corrupted the youth, and that it was like opium. So among those musicians who stayed in Iran, um, the ones worst affected were, of course, women. And uh, in particular, women vocalists. Majid Darachani, a member of the important Chabosh group early on in the early years of the revolution, uh, a composer and a tar player, relate to me the anecdote of how uh, forces of the revolutionary forces basically stormed their building soon after the revolution and asked for two of the Chabosh tapes. First of all, asked for Hengame Akhavan and Sima Bina, who were the two female vocalists of Chabosh, to leave the group, and for also those tapes to be um, changed and the segments that they had sung to be taken out of those tapes. And unlike many others, however, uh, many uh, women, of course, were stopped in their tracks, but many did continue in their, in their perseverance um, and um, uh, following basically their, their professions. Um, Sima Bina was one of them. Um, she, she was a member of Chabush and uh, a highly accomplished um, musician of Persian classical music. She managed to, she's today uh, perhaps the foremost uh, expert on folkloric music and gives concerts to sold out audiences across the world. Other prominent singers like Simin Ghanem, Pari Zangana, and Pari Maliki, who stayed in Iran, eventually started giving concerts to all female audiences. Nearly two decades into the revolution, the state came up with the, with the given frameworks for that. Other um, singers still, such as, for example, um, Mahsa Bahdat and uh, sort of members of the younger generation, they simply refused to sing in all, all female, um, to all female audiences. And uh, the most prominent among those is, of course, Parisa, who to this day has refused to sing inside Iran and uh, but commands huge audiences abroad. Yet others have managed to sort of, you know, uh, play with the rules of the system and uh, publish their voices in, in multi-vocal records or in other ways that is sort of permitted. So either by the male singer lowering their voices while so that the female voice can become more prominent. Um, but at the end of the day, women musicians cannot publish records that features their souls um, solo. So how do the official bodies of the Islamic Republic justify this ban against the, I have some photographs of some of the musicians who have persevered and, um, and published many great works in post-revolutionary Iran. But how do official bodies of the Islamic Re Republic justify this ban against the female voice? Um, or I should probably ask, is there actually a ban against the female voice? And that's where things actually get interesting. The core of this issue has to do with the term qana in Islamic law, which refers to a kind of singing that comes from the throat and causes tarab. Tarab in turn is defined as a state wherein one is overly enraptured and excited due to immense ecstasy or overly stressed and perturbed due to immense sadness. Ghana is usually the fair at gatherings of amusement and vanity. Music, on the other hand, Khomeini defines as the sound that comes from musical instruments, not meant for such gatherings of joy and um, leisure. However, Khomeini also explains that certain kinds of Ghana singing from the throat are halal and excluded from the above definition, namely the kinds of singing that remind the human being of righteousness, such as songs of lamentation and Quranic recitation, and the songs of camel herders and um, songs in weddings. Altogether, when asked who decides what is Ghana, Khomeini says Orfiast. It's uh, based on convention. Um, this is uh, a um, printout of a, a copy of uh, his last fatwas on music. And uh, it's, it's, it's very small print and a little hard to see. But if you look at the first item there, the question is, قبلن فرمودید um, باید um, فرمودید باید که موسیقی مطرب حرام um, فرمودید um, که موسیقی مطرب حرام است و صداهای مشکوک اشکالی ندارند تشخیص این امر به عهده کیست Previously you said that um, مطرب music is haram and mashkuki voices sort of that are up to question um, uh, don't have a pro, uh, um, uh, 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 and the ones that are mashkuk, that are up to, for question, don't have a problem. So who decides this? And he says it's, uh, it's up to convention. So um, 
when you look at that, it's based, you can see how that wouldn't really clarify anything. In a highly contested cultural and political space like that of the Islamic Republic, what is convention and who really decides convention? Uh, it's a highly, pro convention is a highly problematic term um, for, for the determination of that. Female singing was so widely considered unacceptable in traditional settings that all female singing was at first automatically relegated to the category of ghana. As Parisa told Mozaffari, she was just told soon after the revolution that she could no longer sing or teach singing because the female voice was simply haram. Toward the late 80s, when in a series of very public jurisprudential argumentations and reasonings between various leading ayatollahs and maraji taqlid, sources of emulation, the Islamic Republic instituted the policy of maslahat, expediency. So giving preferences to policies that were in the interest of the nizam of the state, um, even if they contravened the sharia. That is basically what maslahat or the policy of expediency means. Um, Khomeini, so toward the late 80s, uh, based on the principle of maslahat, established that the sale of musical instruments and the promulgation of certain kinds of music was permitted after all. This was best recorded in a conversation between Khomeini and Rafsanjani, then President Akbar Rafsanjani, which was later reported by Khomeini's son, Ahmad, in a public speech. Rafsanjani asked the leader, previously you declared that music was forbidden. Why do you no longer object to it? The imam's answer was, let us assume that the music in question was broadcast by the radio of Saudi Arabia, the source of all evil, in Khomeini's view. Then I would forbid it, because wherever Tawut, meaning Satan or idol worship, is in power, opposition to what he undertakes is allowed, and such opposition conforms to maslahat. But, um, excuse me. Um, but uh, here, where the Islamic State is in power, a different form of regulation is valid. So even in the question to uh, Imam Khomeini back then in February 1988, uh, when he did mention the notion of uh, maslahat, basically, um, his, in his last fatwas on music, nobody even asks him whether the solo female voice is permitted. Th that's how out of question it was. So in the questions put to Khomeini in, in, the, in his last estefta, in the last estefta's that he received, you see number six, again, it's a quite sort of fine print. Um, the question is, is it, is it permitted to use the solo voice of a man? And uh, he says basically the, the fatwa is the same as I have previously given. So the, the fatwa is if it doesn't have any, um, if there's no facade in it, if there's no corruption in it, it doesn't lead to lahv, if it doesn't lead to the kind of idol worship or you know, removing oneself from God, then it's permitted. Um, and then the question number seven, the second one up there is, چنانچه در اجای قطع موسیقی نیاز به صدای زنان به طور دست جمعی باشد میتوان از وجود آنها استفاده If there's need for the use of women in a collective way for a piece of music alongside the use of voices of men, is that okay? And he says, اگر فساد نداشته باشه, اگر فساد داشته باشه باید اجتناب شود. یعنی um, if, it has, if it is corrupt or can lead to corruption, one must uh, distance oneself from that. Uh, so it's, it's asked whether the, the collective voice of women is allowed, and there he says if it has corruption, one shouldn't do it. He doesn't say right away, it doesn't have a, you know, it's not problematic. It, again, it's conditioned based on whether it promotes um, corruption. So nobody actually asks him whether the solo female voice is permitted. Um, now I want to make a big jump forward. So these uncertainties around music still exist today, of course, um, but in early 2011, in fact, the sort of one motto that one hears about music in Iran is taklifa musiqi roshanis, the uh, music is in limbo, the regulations are so vague, the, somebody mentioned the notion of ambiguity as a, as a, a form of policy making almost, how wielding ambiguity leaves people in limbo and unable to really take action and um, know where they stand. So these uncertainties, uncertainties still stand, but in early 2011, uh, this Sadaba Simai Jomhuri Islami Iran, the state uh, radio and television of the Islamic Republic, 
undertook something unprecedented and published and distributed to all radio and television offices a 10-page document titled Requisites for the Broadcast of Music in Media. Um, this is a document that I managed to receive from the head of uh, radio research at Sadao Sima in Tehran back then in 2011. Uh, it consists of the most important views on music expressed by Ayatollah Khamenei, the current supreme leader, uh, an addendum of clarifications on Islamic terms regarding music, and lists uh, of do's and don'ts. I just want to quick, I couldn't really bring it up on keynote, but I just want to show you what this document looks like. It's, um, so finally, up to this point, um, what would happen was that uh, they, there would be sessions would be held with um, the um, various centers uh, and representatives of the supreme leader. These uh, views would be, and these views could also be promulgated in fighter prayers, for example, and these views would be sort of passed down to the managers, and those managers again would sort of you know, distribute these views and make clear to their underlings uh, what the rules and regulations were, even though they weren't very clear. Finally, in 2011, for the first time, there's a document that actually states what is allowed and what is not allowed. So um, I won't actually have time to go into it, but aside from uh, a number of regulations, there's, there are then also clarifications on, for example, Ghana, what, it, what constitutes Ghana, um, what, um, you know, and also some, uh, some of the fatwas of relevant uh, religious authorities on the issues. So one would think that with this, there should have been much more clarity on, uh, on the issue of music, and perhaps even on the female voice. Um, but in my conversations with officials who were intimately involved with the processes of negotiating the per permissible in radio and television, um, I, I came to understand that really the way this document came about was that officials within state television and radio were fed up with these uncertainties. Uh, one of them, a senior official within IRB's vetting bodies, Dr. Hassan Riya, he told me, the source of limitations within the media has been the views of our Marajit Haqlid, um, adding, as the highest sources of authority, they're very influential. However, they do not agree among one another. Some regard music as completely haram, others have conditions under which it is halal. Eventually, it appears, managers within, the, within state television and radio um, basically approached uh, representatives of the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei and said, can you not come forth with, with, a, with a guiding sort of document for us? Um, there was apparently a lot of uh, protest. Dr. Mehdi Labibi, the general director of uh, state radio research, the, of the state radio research team, told me um, people were um, just scared uh, all the time. They would self-censor because they were worried that if they broadcast a piece of music, they could get into trouble, perhaps lose their jobs. And so according to Lab, Lab, uh, Labibi, uh, from the time that people resolved to express these views until Azatollah Zarghami, at the time the head of Sadao Sima, asked the Supreme Leader to issue written edicts, it took something like 10 years for this document to come about. And Labibi told me, this is now our foundation and it makes sense. Why? Because the source who gives us direction, Ayatollah Khamenei, is both a high religious um, leader authority and the country's highest political, of, uh, political official. Many Ayatollahs have positions on religious principles, but Mr. Khamenei considers the political circumstances as well. Now, no other sources can interfere because we refer to the guidelines he has given us. After all, the expectation of our channels is that they make good programs and attract viewers and listeners, and one of our most important tools in this regard is music. So placing Khamenei in the ultimate position of decision making regarding these matters confirms, of course, that the Islamic Republic, um, that while Islamic foundations matter, it is also the case that due to the diverging interpretations of these foundations, and because the Islamic Republic itself is a political entity, um, many things operate on the policy and principle of expediency. Decisions regarding music are necessarily based not only on religious, but also on political considerations. And yet Khamenei's uh, guidelines have not eliminated all of the gray areas in musical policy. 
nor even, for that matter, most of them. This is in part because the leader's guidelines still retain the same ambiguous language. Several of the items in the requisites document that I have here involve forbidding the broadcast of music that is trite or immoral, terms that are up for interpretation. But even for the more or less clear prohibitions, such as the ban on the solo female voice, the parameters can be flexible. That is because, as Labibi explained to me, IRB, Islamic uh, Republic Broadcasting officials, can send individual requests to the Supreme Leader's Bureau of Response to Religious Questions. So for example, they asked whether it was permissible to have a woman's solo voice in the title song of Mukhtar Nameh, which was a very popular television series that was aired in 2010 and 2011. Um, so this uh, epic television series is on the life of Mukhtar Tharafi, an early Shia revolutionary who set up a rebellion in Kufa to avenge Imam Hussein's martyrdom. Because the song was religious and for the elevation of man, Mr. Khamenei allowed it, even though clerics from outside of state radio and television protested. So I just want to show you what this sounded like. There's, there's a solo female voice in the title track of this um, television series aired on uh, Sadao Siman, state television. <laughs> I should also note that the requisites document that I had up before, um, in that document, based on the Supreme Leader's guidance, um, which is based on the Supreme Leader's guidance, uh, is really only meant for, the, for use within the strict confines of state television. Outside of the sphere, Khamenei's own jurisprudence can be more flexible, adding to the confusion. Toward the end of 2014, 2015, the issue of the female voice came to the fore in the media, mostly because of two incidents. Namely, a concert in Tehran's Unity Hall, Talar Bahdat, where the female Ava singer Mahdiya Muhammad Khani sang certain segments solo. Um, and this is Mahdiya Muhammad Khani here, and this is, I have an, uh, a newspaper article um, basically declaring the first uh, female uh, vocalist to uh, perform a show after the um, revolution, meaning being the first to sing solo after the revolution. This was in the press back then. Um, then there was a CD publication that featured only the female singer Nushin Tafi um, on the cover, although she was accompanied on all tracks by a male singer, which is permitted. This led to mis misrepresentations in the media that led some ulama in turn, some clerics in Rom and elsewhere, to believe that uh, the Ministry of Culture and Guidance uh, had given a permit for a solo female album. Three sources of emulation close to Khamenei issued statements attacking Irshad's policies and reiterating that female singing was haram. In response, the director in charge of dissemination of Khamenei's edicts um, again, very fine print, um, Muhammad Hussein Fallahzadeh was asked to clarify the Supreme Leader's jurisprudence on the permissibility of women singing solo in public. In a widely publicized piece, Fallahzadeh responded that Ayatollah Khamenei had decreed that if the singing is not qina and the listener does not listen to it with the purpose of pleasure or without sexual innocence, meaning um, without does not listen to it without sexual innocence, meaning listens to it without sexual innocence, with sexual innocence. Um, <laughs> it's all complicated phrasing. Uh, uh, if it's free of other sources of corruption, it is halal. So a lot of ifs. So this, however, was actually not a sudden change, even though it sounds surprising coming from Khamenei. Only six years after uh, Khomeini's edict, last, Khomeini's last fatwa, uh, when no one had dared to ask Khomeini whether it was okay for a woman to sing solo, people had dared to ask Khomeini, this is six years uh, afterwards, um, whether it was okay for the, for the female voice um, uh, to, be, uh, to be sort of listened to. 
Um, and I have his um, fatwa here. Again, it's very fine print. But basically, Khamenei is asked, uh, this is an issued fatwa of Khamenei. Uh, it's so small, even in my own print, that I have a hard time to read. But, استماعی صدای زن نامحرم در موارد زیر چه حکمی دارد؟ So, listening to the voice of the woman in these categories, it's the one that you see, sort of the long paragraph. Um, what, is, what is your judgment on, on within these categories? So, whether it's the Quran recitation, Marsi Khani singing Marsiyas, uh, singing national anthems, uh, singing songs, uh, uh, sing, uh, just sort of usual general talking or uh, the laugh or crying of a woman. So on all of these counts, uh, Khamenei says um, his fatwa is the one that I just read by his spokesperson that if it doesn't have you know, all these uh, sort of corrupting elements, then uh, the, the voice of the woman in and of itself is not problematic. So perhaps on the one hand, Khamenei's religious views are on the whole more liberal than that of other conservative ulama, which is something that Labibi, the radio official, was telling me. Um, on the other hand, there's so many qualifications inserted in that short edict that it eludes any clear deduction and only contributes to the general sense of confusion within the realm of music. So it appears that um, while through the principle of maslahat, expediency, doing what's in the interest of the nizam of the state of the Islamic Republic, official policy making bodies were able to categorically permit the use of uh, the use, education, and distribution of music, they're unable to apply the same principle to the female voice. They're unable to fully resolve whether having the solo female voice in the public sphere, having female musicians appear in public media and concerts and singing to mixed gender audiences is in the interests of the state. Or one might conclude, given that we're now into the fourth decade of the Islamic Republic, that they have in fact shown through their actions that they do not believe it to be in the interests of um, the Islamic Republic. However, state bodies are also less likely to clamp down on the activities of female musicians. Gradually so over the last four decades. There are ups and downs. So after the, um, the incidents with Mahdi Muhammad Khani singing some pieces solo in Talar Vahdat and then that album cover of Nushin Tafi, there was a big backlash against female musicians. There were concerts where female instrumentalists were even asked to leave the stage. Um, but the sort of the grand arc seems to be sort of you know going toward more easing of restrictions. Um, and maslahat or not, women musicians themselves have pushed the boundaries, and their voices are increasingly heard in the public sphere. They've always been heard in private. Nobody stopped listening to female musicians in private. Um, and they're increasingly uh, more heard in the public sphere. They're not really in the real public sphere, but in the virtual one. The former member of the Chavosh um, that I mentioned, Majid Rahshani, um, he was the composer of the a group that uh, performed the piece in Talar Vahdad with Mahdi Muhammad Khani singing uh, a piece solo. Uh, he has been putting together female, all female ensembles for a few years now. He's, he's got a daughter who's a singer. He's, this is really sort of his, his um, life's work now. And um, one of his ensembles, the Mah Ensemble, published several pieces on YouTube a couple of uh, years ago, which got a lot of traction in Iran and abroad. It features women, all of whom have been studying and practicing music within the given permitted framework of the Islamic Republic. The older singer whom you will see in this video, um, Khurbash Khalili has been on several albums co-singing with others, especially Malihe Saidi and other male singers. Um, the space they have created is a tribute to their own efforts and vision, and I want to just leave you with um, an excerpt of this video. <laughs> Thank you. 
listen to it for longer too. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, Nahid, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. So I chose to begin my presentation with the narratives of the Iranian musicians that I conducted oral history interviews with in 2016 as a part of my master's thesis at the New School. An integral part of my project and its aim is its hybridity, combining transcriptions, historic contextualization, and written analysis with the voices and narratives of four Iranian women working as musicians today. So between the experiences that were recounted to me and the representations like complex mediations entangled in issues of power, political and societal, overlapping patriarchies, contemporary forms of Islamophobia, and the globalized music industry. So now you will hear excerpts of these oral histories. Unfortunately, I can't play the whole thing. They're very long. Um, but I wanted to separate some segments so you can hear their voices and parts of their stories. So these are the locations of all the musicians that I interviewed. There were four. So what were some of the, what was the biggest obstacle you think you faced so far in your life as a musician? Well, as a musician, definitely the fact that women cannot sing, and well, I cannot sing in my country is has always been a problem, uh, and um, of course, uh, it it's much better. I mean, I'm happy that I can. I'm living out of the country, and I I can sing, but it doesn't uh, it it doesn't solve the problem at all. So it's like uh, well, I cannot sing at all, but. Um, it's totally different when you sing in your country. When you sing for, um, when you can um, walk on a, you know, on a, uh, on a kind of safe street. Uh, it's uh, in Iran. It's not safe, but also out of Iran, it's not that um, everybody know know where what you're doing you know, when you walk. So you may sound odd, you know, um, and of course you are very very limited audience, uh, which is not comparable to the people who, um, who listen to you in your country and who can understand music. And of course, the, uh, it really changed the, your uh, path, you, I mean, your life, definitely, because uh, everything works differently for my male colleagues, I think. Um, of course, with, um, in the cyberspace, the story is different. And there is more kind of a um, freedom of any kind. Uh, so uh, maybe that's the space that people can really um, come into, you know, mm -hmm. um, because the law is kind of the same for everybody. Uh, but uh, of course, in the in the actual life is it's not in the actual space, I mean, it's, it's different. So first, because you had two questions, before you were asked, you asked generally whether you had a, the obstacles about as a rapper, just mm -hmm. not generally, a female, not necessarily as a female. And I talk, I'd like to talk about that, because I think that, that was, I think most of the obstacles that there weren't there were because of the, the step up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not necessarily because I was a woman. Um, because first of all, rap had a really negative, negative uh, uh, just resonance in people's mind in Iran. It's so funny. I don't know why and what what did this come from? How how did it like just merge? Because I was in Baku, like in Azerbaijan, when it happened. But they were calling the girls. There was a certain type of like um, uh, tying your scarf at the back, kind of made you hardcore, <laughs> and it kind of made I guess you were a slut, which if it's among like you know, uh, middle school kids, so what does that ever mean? But they called those girls rap girls. <laughs> and even before there was any rap music in Iran, but for some reason, that's how it is kind of, I don't know. And I was really small, so I didn't understand. And I remember I spoke to people was like, oh, she's rap, she's a rap girl. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, she does this and this. 
that went to Iran and that person kind of existed. Um, I mean, that was that was a word that we heard in the Iranian school in Azerbaijan. So it came from some, was something that came from Iran. It wasn't something that was only in there. But later, I think I mean that slowly kind of faded out. But because of that small um, trend, I guess there was a negative image in people's mind. And then because of also then later. America mainstream hip hop, the, what they show on the TV and stuff was just, you know, party girls and bikinis and just drugs. So there's always this always negative charge. <laughs> Is it difficult to, to, to achieve that separation? Do you feel people expect you to be political because you're from Iran? No, I think and... kind kind of ways you can tell people you can kind of uh, kind of uh, um, form your image. I mean, you can construct your own image somehow. So I think um, people at the beginning wanted wanted to make me the activist. You know, I I in somehow very uh, smoothly I denied that, uh, and I tried to keep people concentrated on my music. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I I know that this in itself is something. Um, I think in some way, you know, uh, so uh, I understand that it's not just music making because of course many other things, uh, political things, social things are um, just uh, um, stimulated by art, you know, it's obvious, but uh, I like to keep people very concentrated on my music. Uh, I was asked to perform in UCLA, in a rally. That was a wake-up call for me. And I saw that actually in my uh, uh, speech here, that for years I was um, called, proudly calling myself an activist. And I was in front of federal building. Anything that happened in Iran, for women in Iran, for uh, students in Iran, for prisoners in Iran, I was up there. Whether singing or shouting, you know, I wanted to be there. But that green movement showed me that I was a prejudiced activist. I still cry when I say because I didn't do anything for any other people that they were in pain and they were in crisis. It was only about me and my country. Green movement, I saw that the whole world was green with us. But for that green, green movement, actually, I wrote a song. Uh, I wrote a song about some. Uh, I had a dream that I was flying, and as I fly, I go to dark floor. I go to China with all these girls killing. I go to, you know, every country with the crisis, and and uh, I say, you know. I was horrified that I would wake up and I saw that I'm in China, I'm in Darfur, you know, three million people die. So, and then at the end, I came to Iran to talk about that green movement. So, yeah, I think that green movement was a wake up call for me. So, these are just some of the excerpts. Um, I want to start kind of talking about my project, specifically why I chose oral history. In my works in academia and as a writer, a journalist, I always fall back on this method because it's revealing of individual complexities, nuances, contradictions are left intact. And in this way, the narration retains a more protective stance against what we usually see on the media. At the same time, I, as the interviewer, am not simply a name at the top of an article. I'm there, you hear me, you hear my questions, and my slip-ups are revealed also. 
So a little background on my research. I reached out to 15 Iranian musicians, female musicians. I heard back from six and four at the end were the ones that I managed to arrange interviews with. None of my narrators were living in Iran at the time, but they were all born there. My narrators were offered a Farsi translator, but all preferred to speak in English, and all opted against remaining anonymous. They all signed release forms and received copies of their narrations and the interviews. These interviews took place um, between October 2015 and February 2016 over Skype. As you can tell, the quality is not necessarily the best with video component enabled in two of the four interviews with Salam AMC and Ziba Shirazi. I used the principles of oral history and best practices as a guide. The, last, the interviews lasted anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, and two of my narrators were able to speak with me for a second session. So some of the questions I'd like to begin with um, as I contextualize my project. Um, is one, why is it important to bring specifically women's narratives to the forefront of the question on music in Iran? Two, how is this problem of fundamental human rights in Iran tied to and perpetuated by Western media's representation of Iranian women specifically? And three, how can we as academics, researchers, musicians, and fans recognize and remove ourselves from the role we play in a double bind that only perpetuates the problem? The first question, I'm going to tackle those, none of these three. Um, I'd like to refer back to the title of my presentation and project. Why is it important to hear someone's voice? And specifically, in this case, the voice of the female musician. It's unlikely that a conference has ever been held on the use and value of written sources, yet when it comes to oral histories, there always remains a certain doubt as to their validity. And why is that? To me, one of its strengths, in fact, as a methodology, is that it is so frequently analyzed, taken apart and questioned, and I'll get deeper into these questions later on. For now, though, I would like to focus on its most positive contributing factor to my project and to its overall methodology and contribution to academia, which is the voice. And I would like to firstly contextualize this notion using um, from, from a sound studies perspective, because that's my background also, um, in his 1972 essay, The Grain of the Voice, French literary theorist Roland Barthes identifies the grain inherent in spoken or sung vocalizations as, quote, the grain is the body and the voice as it sings, the hand as it writes, the limb as it performs, end quote. The grain is more than timbre, it is the language of sound supplementing the language of sense. The summoning not only of a body, but of some sort of ineffable essence bound to the effability of language. Bartz's thoughts are often quoted in popular music studies, but here I would like to consider his statement not to compare singing voices and their values, but to stress the singularity and significance of the individual voice. I would also like to consider vocalist and composer Meredith, Meredith Monk's philosophy of the voice as a, quote, manifestation of the self. For decades, Monk and her vocal ensemble have been creating non-narrative collaborations in which the voice itself is used as a means for communication. Monk has stated time and time again that she considers the voice to be a, quote, a language in itself, one that crosses cultural and linguistic barriers and speaks directly to people on an intuitive level, end quote. Now, in conjunction with these ideas, I'd like to introduce the oral imaginary, which uh, Roshan Akkeshti from the Ethnic Studies uh, Department at UC um, coined and explained in in a paper of hers that I'm a very big fan of and I recommend highly. Um, according to Roshan Kesti, contrary to everything she learned about the hegemony of ocular centrism and specularity, in the context of world music, there was instead a phonocentrism. She goes on to establish the ear as a site of oral and effective interaction between a listener and the racialized and gendered other of world music. In other words, the experience of musical pleasure in the case of world music is shaped by power relations. The performer in the world music market is exotic and other. More so, usually uh, the Western listener of the world music genre would not have had exposure to its conventions and will know little about the social qualities of the genre beyond what is included in the marketing of the music. So with this theoretical background in mind, 
I'd like to move on to two ideas that I had in my project, um, two ways of kind of defining the limits that are on the female voice in Iran, the female musician's voice. Um, I'd like to distinguish between the disruption of the voice and the distortion of the voice. This quote from Jacques Attali um, is indicative of the target that music is specifically today and has been throughout time. In my study, I explored how it is targeted by the Iranian government and Western media, though it's certainly in the aim of other powerful organizations and structures operating glo globally today. So the disrupting of the voice, I would like to, as I, I'll give you some examples, but just to begin, the disrupting of the voice, we can see on the ground in Iran today with censorship, these blurred lines and uncertain restrictions and allowances. <clears throat> and the distortion of the voice we can see from the outside here in the US, in the media that we consume, so mostly on the Western front. Now virtual spaces, the advent of social media and globalization perpetuate the notion that every voice is heard and that we are doing what we can by retweeting or posting an article or headline that speaks to us. Sure, the introduction of a new public space for a musician to divulge their work is great, but it isn't open to all or free from manipulations. In fact, of course, the voices heard in my project are technically only those with access to the internet. And I acknowledge this in my study. So this is the situation in Iran in 2016, according to Free Muse. Um, they are an international advocacy group de dedicated to defending artistic freedom of expression. So th these numbers here show Iran as the primary violator of acts against the freedom of artists for the second year in a row. And music continues to be the most affected of the art forms. Statistics on women are unfortunately lacking. So we already got some very amazing speakers on, on you know, the history of music today. And I will be reiterating a few things we heard, but uh, this is a very important part of my project, which I also wanted to go over. So. The disrupting of the voice is seen on the ground in Iran today and is primarily restricted on apparent religious grounds. But in fact, the exclusion of women's voices can be noted as early as the fourth century with Paul the Apostle's request to quote, let women keep silence in church, end quote, and the Catholic Church's entrusting of their musical needs to choirs of men, boys, and castrati. Women instrumentalists were similarly ostracized during the Renaissance. Musical instruments were attributed male and female characteristics and identities that could not conflict with their players. So what was the situation in Iran like for female musicians throughout the centuries? In fact, engravings on a seal discovered by archaeologists in the 1960s illustrate the first record of an arced harp in Persia. And on the seal is a group of women singing and playing instruments. It dates back to 3400 BC and is reportedly proof of the first female orchestra formed. So in time throughout the Middle Ages and pre-Islamic times, in the court traditions of the Sasanians, Ghassanids, and Lachnids, female musicians were generally slaves that performed for rulers and courtiers. We heard um, about the Matrebs. So it wasn't until the foundation of the Persian dynasties around 550 BC that the status of musicians as a, as a whole experienced a change. The so-called Matrebs were groups of musicians, male or female, that performed at celebratory events. And Motrebs in particular um, are very interesting, I found very interesting in my study to kind of monitor how their status fluctuated with prevailing social views on gender. So during the Safavid and Zand periods, 16th to 18th centuries, female Motrebs were actually quite powerful in status compared to their male counterparts. Now this is of course because of the tie of prostitution to, to the Motrebs. Um, so with the rise of societal appreciation of classical and art music, however, in the Qajar period, prostitution was no longer considered in conjunction with musical practice and female matrabs lost their powerful status and restri were restricted to the Andarun, the part of the house reserved for women. The Pahlavi dynasty saw a rise in artistic autonomies throughout Iran. Musicians managed to separate themselves from the patronage set up to become independent performers, the Rahavzi, a form of musical show performed at celebrations changed the audience performer relationship and that among performers themselves giving male musicians dominance over female groups. Certain individuals stood out 
during the Pahlavi dynasty, including singer Kamaro Maluk Vaziri, whom Nahid mentioned. She was the first female Iranian singer to sing without a socially and religious sanctioned dress code in public. She performed Morgue Sahar, Bird of Dawn, the iconic Persian Taznif, with words by Mohammed Takir Bahar that invoked the fear of the people of Iran during the Persian Constitutional Revolution of 1905 to 1911. I, uh, and incidentally, this was sung by Henga Meakavan at the Fajr Festival in 2016, which is an interesting parallel as this song was used at two different very different points in time in Iran before the same purpose to kind of bring the female voice to the forefront in an act of, you know, of defiance. So Iranian women participated in resistance movements in Iran since the 1890 tobacco riots through to the formation of the Women's Association for Freedom and Women's Secret Union founded in Tehran around the early 1900s. And a very important part of my project was to constantly stress this, that these resistance movements led by women went back to 1890. And female musicians for many years have been establishing and concretizing their rights to perform and practice their art. So in the, addition to the actions of individual artists like Omar, the support of their community was essential to this as well. In fact, she took on the last name Vaziri because of the musician Al-Naki Vaziri, who founded a music school open to women and encouraged their attendance at public events on music and society. Another example is, of course, the Goha radio programs, which are amazing and were established by music lover and assistant prime minister David Pirnia. They increased literacy rates in a country where it was at an abysmal 15% in the 1950s. Um, so what happened after the revolution? It's hard to make any kind of assertion with regard to how life would have been for female musicians had the Islamic revolution not occurred. It's hard to say. What did change after the revolution were the roles that specifically the government and the Revolutionary Guard adopted in this channeling of music in Iran. Residents of, village, of villages in the countryside had their instruments destroyed, and even acclaimed pop musicians such as Gugush were affected. Her song, My Dear Lovable Sir, which had become an anthem for the Islamic Revolutionary Movement, was condemned by the Ayatollah. So voices disrupted, many female musicians left the country. And later on in the post-revolutionary period, we can see a fostering of an environment of uncertainty among local, local artists, especially women. Performances that are given permits from the Ministry of Culture are sometimes canceled at the last minute. These sudden cancellations are often affecting female musicians and many of those that attempt to perform outside of Tehran. Even now, current President Rouhani makes statements like this one at a press conference in May of last year, quote, one of the outcomes of this year's elections was that everyone was at peace with music. However, we are not too fond of cheap music. So it is this dichotomous position taken by the holders of powers in the society that make it so difficult for musicians even today to know where they stand. So following these examples of the disruption in the voice of the voice in Iran, I found one disturbing example of distortion. Farzan Emilani, in Words, Not Swords, details a disturbing scene in Tehran, which she visited in, in the post-revolutionary Iran. She thought she heard a woman singing for onlookers at a restaurant at night, but then she noticed a mustache and trousers. Then she wondered if it was a woman disguised as a man so that she could perform. But her friend explained it was actually a man imitating a female singer, which had become a trend in Tehran. And her friend asked her if she hadn't heard of Mr. Mahisibat. Her friend said, quote, he impersonates Iranian female singers who are in exile now. Honestly, you can't tell the difference, end quote. So the exclusion of women from the public sphere isn't where it stops. There is a strange societal complacency there as well. Though I associate actions on the ground in Iran with disruptions of the voice in the public space, here is a disconcerting example of the distortion of the female voice and acceptance of it as such within and by Iranian society. So as we move on to the distorted image and voice of the female musician in Western media, um, I'd like to start with a quote again by Roshanak Keshti. Um, Iran occupies a mystified place in the Western cultural imagination. And we can see this in several examples I will show you now from various sources. The first is this um, is the cover of the CD and DVD release for a QQ Bang Bang in 2008 by Gugush. 
And within it was a handwritten note which, in which she speaks of, her, of the years when her voice was, quote, imprisoned, and that the judge of her current journey to the, quote, peaks of her voice is you, the audience member. So we don't know what kind of judgment she is awaiting, um, but there is this mystification of what's happening and you know, what she's been through. Hamid Nafisi, a scholar of culture and diaspora studies, suggests that Gugush's absence from the music scene and 20 or so years living in Iran without performing live mythologized her among the diasporic audience and earned her the label of survivor of Iran, the captor. Now this is reminiscent of the American experience of the hostage crisis and won her a great deal of attention by American mainstream media who rarely, if ever, reported on Iranian pop. I also find it pertinent to refer to the opinions and experiences of reporters, journalists, and writers in attendance at a conference in March 2016 at the New School titled Reporting on Iran, Can We Know the Truth? Laura Seeker stated the following, and this exemplifies the narrative that many Western media outlets search for when reporting on Iran in general. Another attendant at this conference, Hadi Gaemi, co-founder of the International Campaign for Human Rights in Iran, separated the media's focus on Iran into three major, major categories. One, the hostage situation in Tehran in the 80s. Second, the perceived threat Iran posed to Lebanon and Israel in the 90s. And finally, the nuclear crisis of the 2000s. So according to Hadi Gaemi, all media content is filtered through the lens of government actions and policies. When in fact, according to him, the Iranian government and Iranian society have been on schizophrenic paths since the revolution. Next, we have, of course, the romanticization of these threats posed by the government, of censorship and imprisonment, and which is exacerbated by the media. Here we have a quote from the former director of the Cannes Film Festival, and that kind of speaks for itself in its absurdity. Uh, next, we have a release of a collection of music, which features female Iranian singers. It's marketed on an unclear generalized statement by Honest John Records, a label owned by British musician Damon Auburn. The liner notes read, the backbone of the collection is a set of powerful performances by women in defiance of the social stigma attached to professional musicianship. Now, this, there is no contextualization to this. What is the social stigma? Professional musicianship, so non-professional musicians, there is no stigma attached to that. I don't know, I found it a little just unclear. And my final example is this part of MTV's campaign, Rebel Music, which had an episode focused on her, Iran. In her narration, Salome MC, who will be hearing perform and speak after this, spoke of when the producers reached out to her to invite her to feature in this episode, but upon feeling it would be a victimized, one-dimensional portrayal, she refused to participate. I would like to play just a few seconds of the opening of the episode. That's about it. So, <laughs> what we see there is, do we see a musician or do we see a woman, a victim, a hijab, you know, what, nothing to do with music. So, our voices are imbued with the power of representation and Iranian female musicians have fought to keep their, theirs heard throughout history. The normative double bind formed by modes of disrupting and distorting their voices, whether imposed by governmental societal pressures, along with the Western media's and our oral imaginary subconscious support of othering perspectives, however, will perpetuate a threat against the Iranian female musicians' right to their own image until confronted head on. As I begin to wrap up my presentation, I'm almost there, I'd like to turn again to Jacques Attali in Noise and Politics as he compares totalitarian and democratic systems of powers, treatment of music, and dedication to the task of channelization and control of sound. I see Iranian female musicians at the crux of these two forms of control. They are affected by the totalitarian need to, quote, ban submersive no subversive noise because it betokens demand for cultural autonomy, support for differences or marginality, and, quote, Yet at the same time, Antali's analysis on the democratic systems above is also applicable. With the above problem in mind, I have argued for the invaluable contribution of the spoken word as an advocate for change. 
A dialogue between politics and music is inevitable. The two have been interlocked in a complex dance since Plato's Republic. However, the stormative double bind revealed has a tangling effect on its participants. Where there could be constructive dialogue between music and politics with potential for cultural enrichment and societal evolution are instead continued infringements upon the rights that these musicians have. This tune must change and one potential path is giving the human voice agency within academia. Of course, questions on the likelihood of whether academic work can change popular attitudes and the radical potential of oral history as a methodology will remain, not to the detriment of any work we do accomplish. These are questions we must challenge in our respective fields of study and confront always, as the women's narratives I presented today show they will do as well. Thank you. for Could you tell us a little bit how the story you tell relates to the film we watched? Uh, is the, because the film claimed uh, that the concert that is shown at the end is the very first time solo women sang in public. And you don't mention that episode in your paper, so I'm uh, confused. Thank you for that question. Um, so the um the performance of uh, the solo uh, female vocalist at that particular concert, which took place in 2013, um, wasn't, uh, I think it, because it involved foreign singers, didn't actually create the kind of splash that uh, Mahdi Mohamed Khani's solo uh, singing at Talar Rahdat created. So following that performance, there was there was there was no press about you know female for the, uh, women for the first time sang solo in post revolutionary Iran. I think that's in particular uh, um, uh, in particular because the, it was sort of a mixed you know foreigners and Iranians group and um, whereas Mahdi Mohammad Khani is sort of the epitome of you know sort of the Iranian uh, uh, female vocalist of Persian classical music and she sang solo at um, at an event which was attended by the Minister of uh, um, uh, Culture and Islamic Guidance, even though he subsequently denied it. Um, I spoke to Majid al and he said uh, he was there briefly. Um, so basically what he was, uh, he was trying to deny the fact that he was present while the solo female singing was taking place. So, you know, I, I mentioned the two, those two instances, Mahdi Mohamed Khani and Nushin Tafi, um, to sort of build the narrative of what led for the press and the clerics to um, to uh, put a very sort of forefront question to Khamenei's spokesperson uh, about his position on the female voice. But it's not that those are the only two instances. Um, you know, these instances happen every now and then. They're not necessarily reported upon in ways that, for example, I would have uh, maybe seen just perusing, you know, sort of online media or even. Uh, um, you know, but you know, every now and then, I, uh, it sort of applies the same thing. Sort of applies to um, the um, uh, the um, showing musical instruments on state television. So th that's another one of the enduring bands, uh, sort of enduring red lines of the Islamic Republic, is um, showing musical instruments on state television. But there have been several instances, and um, I personally know of about four or five. Um, one of them was very sort of public. It happened in a morning news channel, sort of channel one. They had a whole ensemble of uh, classical musicians with their instruments in a morning program, um, which was discontinued. Um, the other ones I know about because I've talked to a lot of people in the field of music. I don't think I would have known if I hadn't had interviews where, you know, if somebody said, well, you know, I've uh, asked, our, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Aliza uh, Asar said that in, uh, he actually performed one of his pieces early on in the uh, or late 90s with a grand piano on state television. So there are sort of instances that you sort of have to collect and find out about. But it, that, that con uh, concept in particular didn't fit my narrative because um, I think because it involved sort of foreign musicians and people didn't really um, put it in that category of what the other performance was.
Um, thank you for your um, presentation. It was uh, very great. I also had a question for Dr. Siamus. It's kind of relating on the um, previous comment as well. Um, I also remember from as early as 2005, like um, Pura Shaili had an album where she was singing solo, but with a very sparse snail solo under her voice, and she had her picture on the album cover. cover. But I guess maybe because there wasn't that much social media happening then, or it wasn't uh, mobilized in that way, mm -hmm. um, or even during the 2005-2006 years, and Talar Parabi, you know, I don't know, you attacked a lot of concerts where it was obvious that the female vocalist is the main vocalist, mm -hmm. and um, there are different strategies they use with the male vocalist there too, and they also sing. Mm -hmm. uh, but what seems to be different now is, um, these incidents are being mobilized through press and social media. Uh, as scholars, how do we continue this discourse, but also stay sensitive to the fact that sometimes uh, being the right shade of political can be monetized, mm -hmm. and it is sometimes mobilized in that way. So how do we strike a balance to deal with these narratives, talk about these issues, but also understand that uh, being the right shade of political can be um, very luxurious in Tehran right now. So it's a good question, but um, I'm not sure I understand it. So when you, um, uh, when you, I understand, so, so what do you mean uh, being monetized? Do you mean um, that it's sort of a trend or? Um... I mean, I can think of another example too. I remember last year, uh, Saul Rafferty went on to expat TV stations mm -hmm. and it became a thing that they need to ban his voice, and it was very, it was televised on TV that he's a controversial figure for this. Mm -hmm. But then a week later, um, it was swept under the rug, and on national TV, on the news, mm -hmm. they kind of plugged the new album coming out, which mm -hmm. I had never. So it's like almost, I don't know, maybe I'm being too pessimistic, but I can see being controversial, being monetized, or being somehow subverted, I see, I see. exploited. Right, right. Um, and I think this issue is also not. Um, free from being used or exploited in that way when uh, people have access to their own narrative through social media. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, with Nushin Taki, that's something that, that's a charge that some people did have. They said, you know, this was sort of intentional. Um, I mean, there, there are always so many um, uh, conspiracy theories around all of these issues, in part because of the um, opaqueness of the information and the, and the things, the sort of operations behind the scenes. And some of them are conspiracy theories, and some of them are probably quite valid. Um, you know, there are probably some producers connected to certain um, people within the Ministry of Culture um, who, um, you know, music is uh, a very profitable business uh, in Iran uh, currently. And um, so how do we uh, make sure that we don't tie things into a narrative of sort of liberalization versus these are just one-off sort of episodes of people wanting to monetize and create sort of hype around something for them. Um, um, well, I think when it comes to this particular narrative, those two instances did force the Supreme Leader spokesperson to make a very public statement about um, the female, solo female voice. So I suppose there isn't really a way to really make sure we keep those things separate um, and that we don't bring in sort of, uh, you know, mon sort of hype uh, instances for, you know, making money and sort of, but in the end, they, that, even if it was for that purpose, it contributed to, um, to that building of momentum of uh, posing that question to the Supreme Leader. Um, and, you know, I think right now is sort of, um, there's been a wave happening. So, you know, there's a, the, I mean, most recently we saw the image of the young girl in Angelov Street with her sort of white scarf on a stick. And um, generally sort of the issue of women's uh, freedom, whether it's the, you know, the presentation of their solo voice or their, uh, the issue of their hijab and so on, uh, it has taken on momentum. And it's, uh, it's something that's being hotly sort of debated in, in Iran today. Thank you very much for the great presentations. Um, I have two questions for you, Nahid. I mean, actually, one is more of a comment. 
But uh, so my first question is, um, are you considering, um, I mean, because you, you refer to the loss for television, but the loss for performance for somewhere like uh, Talar of Daki, it's completely under a different institution. So you can't basically use those and apply them for another um, you know, institution. How do you try to kind of adapt that from this situation to, add to another, uh, which is more of a, instead of a televised national you know, spectatorship, has a live, you know, smaller, but still in a very official setting for performance. Um, so yes, the laws for state television are set from within the um, say, uh, the uh, bodies of the state television and radio, and they are the strictest in the country. So what happens in state television is the, the those regulations are the most conservative. There are basically three sort of you know bodies that wield power or authority over certain um, um, spheres of cultural production. It's state television. It's the Ministry of Culture and Islamic guidance, which is really in charge of giving permits for uh, musical records and um, uh, concert performances and so on. Uh, but it doesn't wield authority over what is done and produced in television, uh, but it wields sort of authority over the rest. And then there's the Jose, of course, uh, which is its own sort of little sort of sphere of authority. And the Jose is um, the uh, policy making, uh, the, uh, the body that actually, for example, gave a permit to um, to uh, Mohsen Nalju's first record in Iran, Torange, was actually permitted by, by the Bose and not by the Ministry of Culture. So how do we separate? Well, what happens on state, tel it's what sort of the, you know, the edicts of the uh, of Khomeini and what happens on state television or the degree to which things are allowed or not allowed on state television, um, while they pertain to state television and radio, can give us some notion of whether there's any loosening of any of those. Because if it is the most conservative place, the, you know, the place where the strictest laws and regulations are made, the easing of those within that space tells us something of uh, outside of that sphere. Um, but you know, the, the ban on the female voice has been applied universally in all fields, so it's not that the Ministry of Culture and Guidance has had a set of, you know, different set of regulations on that issue. It's an issue that is so contested and so tied in with, uh, you know, the edicts of uh, sort of various marriages happening, and uh, it's become so politicized um, that um, if it is to be unlocked, I believe it would probably have to be unlocked first in the most conservative um, place for the other institutions to feel safe because you know all these institutions are run by people who at the end of the day um, are worried about their positions and their jobs and uh, what they can do and what they cannot do and um, so um, that to, to a great extent determines the kind of risks that people are willing to take. And uh, my other, this is as I said more of a comment but can be a question. Uh, just this summer there was a performance in um, Talar Rudaki a dance performance just for women. Um, they weren't allowed to perform it last minute. It, they got, the show got canceled. And uh, the same show was performed just a month ago. Same place. But the only, only change here, only element that changed was that, uh, well, the director of the show had an, uh, had an online television interview. Um, so with you know one of the online inter, um, internally produced uh, programs in Iran. So things can be that easy. Um, I mean nothing changed there for you know, no element, just that buzz that you know that interview created for a while. you know yeah, it's interesting. I mean it's it's really that element of um, you know, sort of almost sort of haphazardness or ambiguity that gives the state that kind of power to wield and leaves people in that state. So um, in that particular case, um, uh, you know, there's there's also a lot of going and coming and uh, negotiating and ultimately um, this um, uh, 
I mean, who knows? Right. Uh, ultimately, I think what what needs what, what one needs to do is actually speak to the people who are involved because you do end up finding out really surprising and interesting things about how these things uh, come about and how certain you know how for example pop music was finally sort of you know greenlighted towards the late nineties and um, there was a narrative out there but um, for myself if I hadn't spoken to the people who were deeply involved in that process I wouldn't really have known I would have just guessed that you know perhaps they wanted to go against the tide of uh, you know, Western music, uh, Iranian music coming in from Los Angeles. So in that particular case, I'm not sure, but um, I was actually one of the performers, yes, performers there. So I'm pretty So much, tell us. Well, that's the case. Uh, that's basically, first of all, it was before um, the change of cabinet. And the other one was uh, that my um, teacher decided to interview with, um, you know, just basically. What was the action? Um, was an internet, but very kind of well-produced mm -hmm. internet television show in Iran. And had the Minister of Culture and Islamic Guidance changed in the interim between sort of the previous? Um, no, it was the same guy. So I mean, it's, that makes a difference. What all I am saying is that many things in Iran are seasonal. Uh, so it's true that you know there are laws, but there are all these elements that come and go, and you never can tell. That's so, true. Yeah, which is why I pointed to the, you know, issue of the ambiguity even of the laws. If they're not clear, I mean, you know, there's there's finally sort of a book, you know, ha sort of a, uh, a directive to people in state television and radio about what to do and what not to do. It, but you know, at the same time, the terminology is so vague um, that once again they can be interpreted in various ways and um, by various people, by various people. If I could take a question from that young girl over there. <laughs> oh, sorry, you have the microphone. Do you mind if I just take a quick question? Um, Wait until you have the microphone. What do Iranian singers do you like? What do they like? What do you like? What do Iranian singers do you like? Oh, sweetheart. Okay, so, you know, we love the Abjis together. We, we go to Abjis concerts together. We love listening to their songs, right? Um, do you like them? Yes. Um, I listen, you know, um, I like Bubush. I listen to Bubush. I have a really soft spot for Haide. Um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Hi, thank you both for such really great presentations. Um, I have a question about voice and silence. So mostly we've been talking, uh, both of you have been talking about the fight for voice, and this is a question mostly for Paula, but also um, I think it uh, relates to both presentations, so I'd be curious to hear both of your responses. I'm wondering in this fight for voice how silence has been narrated, uh, Paula especially by your interlocutors, um, and if there are any subversive engagements with silence or silence as a strategy of resistance and subject formation. Um, I'm curious if how your yeah, interlocutors have um, engaged with silence. Mm -hmm. well, that's a very good question. I think the first thing that came to mind really was um, self-censorship. I feel like um, a lot of my narrators, you know, for self-preservation reasons, for reasons, you know, to continue their careers, to um, establish themselves as musicians, resorted to self-censorship. So adopting moniker, uh, uh, other names to go by, um, um, inserting themselves into the underground music scene and stuff like that. Like, does it feel, when you mention silence, that's what I think of. Um, you know, it's self-censorship, like removing yourself from that place, from the public space where you can be subject to a uh, limitation on your voice and stuff like that. So for, in my narrations, that's where I kind of saw the silence. And there is definitely you know, a self-preservation, as I mentioned, aspect to that. And yeah, that's how, you know, musicians move forward and establish themselves despite everything else. Um, I, I agree with Paula. There's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, um, 
sort of method of resistance, if you if you will, that uh, some female musicians have used. So Patty Silk, for example, simply refused to. Um, she didn't just you know stop singing in public. She just gave up singing altogether for a while. Um, until she had the chance to go abroad and give a concert, and then she restarted her activities and, and um, has been giving concerts since, but not in Iran. So she continues that um, method of silence, as do other singers. I, I mentioned Mansal Baghdad, and, and there, there's a series of others who simply refuse um, to sing within the parameters of the Islamic Republic, even to all female audiences, because they believe, and this is something that Faisal and um mentions in her book. Um, that automatically putting women in a category on their own denigrates their form of art making, puts them in a, um, and you know, I have been to all female concerts in Iran, and I have to say, it's, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's truth to that. There's um, less sort of enforcement of, uh, you know, the kind of, you know, customs and regulations, or, you know, customs that we have in giving respect to a performance and keeping quiet and all of that, they're, they're much less um, sort of kept in all female uh, performances. There's a lot of noise from, uh, you know, chips eating and, uh, and women talking. And, you know, when, when in these all female performances, oftentimes also women find this finally sort of this public space, though all female, but still this public space where they can be sort of free and, and relate to each other in a joyous way. And oftentimes they want the musician to play, you know, something fun and something they can dance to as opposed to sort of whatever pieces the musician herself may have prepared to sing. So um, uh, not partaking in that scene and keeping silence is a way of expressing that protest of that sort of bifurcation and denigration of their field. There's one question down here. The microphone is coming to you. This is basically for Paula, but um, you know we've been talking a lot about um, the difficulties that female performers find after uh, the revolution. But um, it seems to me, from when I was living in Iran before the revolution, uh, that uh, the stigmatization of musicians and performers is nothing new. It was there before the revolution, and women performers were very much stigmatized. And sometimes they'd be threatened to be killed by their relatives, and then, uh, and but that at that time it was a bottom-up thing. It was not from the top down. And now we have the same thing, the same kind type of stigmatization, but it's coming from the top down. And I just wanted to ask you what you thought that idea. In other words, the musicians and the performers get the short stick all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. No, of course I I wanted to go through as briefly as I could um, because of time restriction, kind of like the historical, what I found, like these little glimpses through history of what it was like to be a female musician in Iran and, you know, their representation and what they, well, what they meant for people, like how they were viewed by people. And of course, I, I feel like at the same time, I don't know, um, from the narrations, uh, that, that I conducted and the women that I spoke to, I feel like it isn't only from the top down right now. I feel like it's still coming from within society, within families. Um, one of the things I really want to expand upon in my research in the future is being, of course, I want to be on the ground in Iran and I want to speak to women outside of Tehran and get a sense for you know, what it's like for them, because I have a feeling it's not definitely not just the government that's in their way. You know, I feel like it's it's more than that. We don't hear about it. Um, but I, I, I think, I'm thinking. I don't know. You you live there, but I I don't know if much has changed in that regard. If anyone does, um, I, I just have one a great question. I want, I want to comment for you that uh, bed bath of, of Khomeini's that you showed. I asked Mr. Mohajarani about it, you know, he's in London, and he said that this term 
it's ORF. Mm -hmm. So this is a device that is almost always used in these bedbugs because every Ayatollah has their own following mm -hmm. and they don't want to step on anybody's toes. So mm -hmm. they give their opinion and they say, but it's up to ORF at the end. So this is actually like a, a rhetorical device that they use, mm -hmm. you know, so that they can't get uh, stuck out. Very interesting. Um, I also want to mention very quickly, I, I think we have to sort of uh, cut short the Q&A session uh, in response to your, uh, I, I agree the pressure is also from bottom up, it's not just from top down. And I spoke very recently to a sort of third generation rapper now, so Salome um, is, uh, you know, Iran's first female hip hop musician. Um, there now have been, you know, uh, the third generation is quite young. Uh, I think she might be sort of, you know, one of the older ones of the third gen, Just, Justina. And uh, she was saying how um, you know things really changed in her in her private life, uh, in her personal life, when she started rapping and putting her videos <laughs> online. People and she's uh, you know a woman, a young woman who lives in Tehran. People instantly started looking at her differently. And um, in in the interview with me, she even says something like, um, "I am no longer because I because I'm." putting myself out there, um, it is considered that I do not have the kind of shame that is valued in Iranian society, and I'm no longer that girl who's uh, necessarily on a tra trajectory to marry and have children and whatnot. I've, I've sort of left that trajectory. This is, you know, a woman in her um, uh, very early 20s in Iran right now. Okay, at the recommendation of Dr. Siamis, we're going to wrap up this session and move on to the performance by Solomon. Thank you. Thank you.